Welcome to a short summary of the 2010 Advanced Life Support Guidelines. My name is Dr Charles Deakin and I'm the Chair of the Advanced Life Support Working Group for the European Resuscitation Council. The three main areas that I'm going to cover uh, are the management of patients pre-arrest, the management of patients during the arrest itself and then finally the management of patients following return of spontaneous circulation. In terms of prevention of cardiac arrest, uh, there are two main aspects that are emphasised in the new guidelines. Firstly, the increased awareness of the warning signs associated with potential risk of sudden cardiac death out of hospital. Secondly, there's also increased emphasis on the use of physiological warning signs, mostly for patients within the hospital environment itself. In terms of the advanced life support guidelines for the management of cardiac arrests, you will see from the algorithm that essentially it remains unchanged in terms of structure from the 2005 guidelines that you'll be familiar with. In terms of the main changes for the management of patients in cardiac arrest, there are a number of areas I'd like to cover. Firstly, chest compression. Although this obviously is of importance to basic life support, it is a common theme throughout the resuscitation algorithm and also applies to advanced life support. The emphasis of good quality chest compression, minimising the pre- and post-shock pauses, is emphasised. A new change in the guidelines is the uh, requirement to continually uh, perform chest compressions whilst the defibrillator is charging and only take your hands off whilst the shock is deliver delivered, resuming chest compressions straight away. The previous guidelines uh, recommended a short period of chest compressions for unwitnessed cardiac arrests or where the patient was thought to have been collapsed for more than five minutes. This is no longer recommended as mandatory and defibrillation should be performed on patients in cardiac arrest as soon as a defibrillator is ready. In terms of the second and subsequent shocks uh, and the fixed versus escalating energy debate, there is some work showing that a escalating strategy reduces the number of shocks required compared with a fixed dose by phasic strategy. However, the rates of survival are not significantly different between fixed or escalating strategies and therefore the guidelines do not recommend one uh, over the other strategy. However, it is recognised that if the first shock isn't successful, you may want to consider increasing the energy levels uh, for second and subsequent shocks if that's something that your defibrillator is capable of doing. In terms of the drugs, there are some uh, subtle changes in, in terms of the drugs. The uh, dose of adrenaline uh, remains unchanged at one milligram, and as with the previous guidelines, the adrenaline is given every second cycle. The timing of adrenaline is changed. With the 2005 guidelines, the adrenaline was given immediately before the third shock. This has been revised for the 2010 guidelines, and we now recommend that adrenaline is given immediately after the third shock. This is in order for the subsequent two minutes of chest compressions to circulate the adrenaline so that it is effective uh, at the end of that two-minute period where, when another shock may be indicated. For adrenaline administration for non-shockable rhythms, again, there are no changes, uh, and it's recommended that adrenaline is given as soon as IV access is achieved and then every second cycle. There are changes to atropine. Uh, and essentially atropine has been removed from the advanced life support guidelines. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, the bradycardia associated with cardiac arrest is thought not to be due in principle to vagal tone. And secondly, if one milligram of adrenaline has not increased the heart rate, it is unlikely that uh, atropine will be any more effective. So routine administration of atropine for uh, a systole uh, has been removed. In terms of the other drugs, uh, particularly amiodarone, lignocaine, magnesium, buffers and intravenous fluids, there are essentially no changes in the 2010 guidelines in the administration of these drugs. One other aspect of drug administration that has been changed is the route of drug delivery. Endotracheal drug delivery is no longer recommended uh, because absorption through the lungs is so poor and if intravenous access cannot be gained promptly, it's recommended that intraosseous access is now considered early on in the management of your patient. The final drug I'd like to just mention uh, are thrombolytics. Obviously, there's been a lot of interest in this drug. Um, however, studies have shown that it is not effective to be given uh, as a routine part of cardiac arrest management, um, and uh, it should only be considered uh, as a drug when it's suspected that the patient may have arrested uh, due to an acute pulmonary embolus. And as before, ongoing cardiac uh, massage is not a contraindication to the administration of a thrombolytic drug. 
Moving on to airway management, uh, there is now less emphasis on early tracheal intubation uh, unless it's achieved by highly skinned individuals, and the aim of that is to minimise interruptions to chest compressions. There is also more emphasis on the use of capnography to confirm and continually monitor tracheal tube placement, uh, as it also provides an indication of the quality of chest compressions and also an early indication as to the return of spontaneous circulation. Moving on to post-arrest management, it's now recognised that uh, implementation of a comprehensive, structured post-resuscitation treatment protocol may improve survival in cardiac arrest victims after a term of spontaneous circulation. And there are a number of particular aspects of this therapy that I'd just like to mention. First of all, oxygen therapy. Uh, although 100% oxygen is still recommended for management of patients during the cardiac arrest itself, there is some recent work suggesting that excessive levels of oxygen following return of spontaneous circulation may be harmful. It's therefore recommended that once return of spontaneous circulation has been established, inspired oxygen should be titrated to achieve oxygen saturations in the range of 94 to 98% and no higher. Primary percutaneous coronary intervention uh, is also an area that uh, is recommended in the management of these patients where appropriate. The management of blood glucose is discussed in the guidelines, uh, particularly avoiding blood sugar levels uh, above 10 millimoles per litre, but at the same time avoiding hypoglycemia, which we know is detrimental to neurological outcome. The use of therapeutic hypothermia is also discussed in the guidelines. Uh, it is now becoming well established in the management of patients post-cardiac arrest, and it is something that the guidelines discuss in detail, both for patients who have been resuscitated from shockable and non-shockable rhythms. There are, however, no specific changes in terms of the strategy for the implementation of this. Finally, the guidelines talk about the unreliability of pro prognostic indicators in comatose survivors, especially in patients treated with hypothermia, and more work is needed in this area in terms of understanding what signs and symptoms are indicative of good outcome in these patients. That concludes a very quick summary of the Advanced Life Support Guidelines. Thank you for listening and further details can be found on the European Resuscitation Council website uh, in the form of downloadable PDF documents. Thank you.